thank God he did. And Hello, the everyone. The the board, how to make it bigger. Mm -hmm. On behalf of the Brewer Foundation and New York University, welcome to the 21st Annual International Public Policy Forum Final Debate. My name is Andrea Sadbury, and I'm the Executive Director of the IPPF. We are pleased to have you join us here at the Harold Pratt House for our final debate of the 2021 to 22 competition. The IPPF was founded in 2001 by the Brewer Foundation and is now jointly administered by the Foundation and New York University. It is the only competition that gives high school students from around the world the opportunity to engage in written and oral debates on issues of public policy. The contest is open to all schools, public and private, for free. This year, more than 120 teams, representing schools in 11 countries and 22 U.S. states, submitted qualifying round essays on the topic resolved. On balance, the hegemony of the United States dollar is detrimental to the world economy. Judges reviewed these essays and selected 64 teams to take, take part in a single elimination written debate tournament. Each team was paired against another, assigned either the affirmative or negative position, and then volleyed papers back and forth via email. This process continued for several months as judges narrowed the field from 64 teams to 32 to 16, and finally to the Elite Eight. Seven of the eight Elite Eight teams traveled to New York as guests of the Brewer Foundation. The eighth team, Team Singapore from the Ministry of Education, competed virtually this morning making this our first hybrid IPPF finals. Throughout the morning, our final eight teams supplemented the written scholarship they've produced over the past seven months with oral advocacy, competing in a series of one-on-one -on -one debates. At this time, we'd like to, to, to go ahead and recognize those schools. Our quarter finalists this year are the Ministry of Education, Singapore, North Allegheny Senior High School from Pennsylvania, the Davidson Academy of Nevada, and Bergen County Debate Club from New Jersey. Our, <laughs> our semifinalists this year are Amity Regional High School of Connecticut and Extraordinary Education Center of Canada. <laughs> Competing this afternoon in our final debate will be Potomac Oak, from Rockville, Maryland, and Pine Richland High School from Gibsonia, Pennsylvania. At this time, I'm going to allow the teams to introduce themselves. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Caden Chen. I'm a junior at Montgomery Blair High School competing under Potomac Caden, Oak. Caden, will you pull your mic oh, up a little bit? Sorry about that. Can you all hear me now? <laughs> um, I'm, oh. Will you just pull it up a little yeah. bit more? Um, so I'm Caden Chen. I'm a junior at Montgomery Blair High School competing in IPPF under Potomac Oak, and I'm the first speaker for my team. I'm Evelyn Shu. I'm a junior at Richard Montgomery High School in Rockville, Maryland. I'm the second speaker for Potomac Oak. My name is Jonathan Wen. I am a senior at Potomac Oak, and I am excited to debate. Hi, my name is Miles Brown. I'm a senior from Pinerton High School, and I will be the first speaker for the negative. Hi, everyone. I'm Amish Sethi. I also go to Pinerton High School. I'm a senior, and I'll be our second speaker. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Nee, and I'm a senior from Pinerton High School, and I'll be your third speaker. Big round of applause for our students. And now to introduce our distinguished moderator and judges. Our moderator for this round will be Mr. David Baker. Mr. Baker was appointed in 1984 as coach of the St. Mark's debate team. He coached debating and taught public speaking for the 16 years prior to his appointment as the director of admission and financial aid at St. Mark's. Under his direction, the St. Mark's Debate Program was named one of the 10 most successful programs of the 20th century, and his debate team won the high school national championship in 1990. Introducing our judges, Mr. Miha Andrik is an international communication, speech, and debate teacher, philosopher, and sociologist based in Slovenia. He is currently head of the program at the Argument Institute on the board of directors of the International Debate Education Association, a board member at Dialexicon, and a head of the International Speech and Debate Program, Bezograd. In the recent past, Mr. Andrik was the director of the National Debate Organization Slovenia and president of the Society for the Development of Humanities. He was the convener of the International Philosophy Olympiad in 2020 and 2021, and has served as program director of several international debate academies. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. William Brewer co-founded the national litigation firm of Brewer Attorneys and Counselors in 1984. Since that time, he has earned a national reputation as one of the most successful lawyers in the United States, practicing exclusively in the field of complex commercial litigation and dispute resolution. Mr. Brewer is also a co-founding partner of the Brewer or sorry, co-founding founder of the Brewer Foundation. A former debater himself, Mr. Brewer helped found the International Public Policy Forum and now serves on its advisory board. He has previously been named Communicator of the Year by the National Speech and Debate Association, formerly the National Forensic League. Ms. Catherine Rubino is the senior editor at Above the Law, where she's worked since 2015. She received her bachelor's degree in journalism and mass communications from New York University and her Juris Doctor from Columbia Law School. Prior to that, Ms. Rubino worked as a corporate litigator. Ms. Rubino has coached college policy debate in the novice, junior varsity, and varsity levels for more than 20 years and is currently the coach at the United States Military Academy. She served in numerous leadership positions in the Cross-Examination Debate Association, including President, Vice President, Regional Representative for the Northeast, Public Relations Chair, and Topic Committee Member. Ms. Rubino has been awarded the Galantine Award for Outstanding Female Coach, the Dr. Amy Fugat Leadership Award for Service to CETA, and the Dr. Neil Birch Award for Coaching. Dr. John Sexton is President Emeritus of New York University, having served as president from 2001 through 2015. Prior to being named NYU's president, Dr. Sexton was dean of the university's law school for 14 years. Dr. Sexton is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and has served as the chairman of the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Of particular interest to today's proceedings, in 2010, Embry University named President Sexton Outstanding High School Debate Coach of the last 50 years for his work with the St. Brendan's High School Debate Team. President Sexton is a member of the IPPF Advisory Board. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Raghu Sundaram is Dean and the Edward I. Altman Professor of Credit and Debt Markets at New York University's Leonard N. Stern School of Business. He was appointed Dean on January 1st, 2018, having previously served as Vice Dean for MBA programs and online learning. Dean Sundaram's work in finance spans a number of areas, including agency problems, executive compensation, corporate finance, derivatives pricing, and credit risk and credit derivatives. He has also published extensively in mathematical economics, decision theory, and game theory. Prior to joining NYU Stern in 1996, Dean Sundaram was on the faculty of the University of Rochester from 1988 to 1996. He holds a PhD in economics from Cornell University. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause. Finally, a quick reminder to our guests to please silence or turn off your cell phones at this time. And with that, I will turn things over to Mr. David Baker. Thank you very much, Andrea, and welcome, everybody. And uh, welcome and congratulations to the two teams. This looks a little intimidating, doesn't it? Don't worry about it. You're ready. It's going to be fun, all right? So here we go. We're going to start with the affirmative's opening statement for a period of eight minutes. You may begin when you are ready. Um. Hello, everyone. So before we begin, I'd like to just give a few thank yous. So first and foremost, thank you so much to the Brewer Foundation and NYU for hosting the IPPF competition. It's been an absolute joy to compete this year, and it's been truly an enlightening experience, and I'm sure I'm speaking for all of us when we say that. Um, and thank you also to the CFR for hosting us in their building. Second of all, I would like to thank my parents for always um, supporting me in my endeavors and debate in IPPF. And thank you so much for letting me sit in the office and shout at a computer screen for hours on end every weekend. Um, third of all, I would like to thank my opponents from Pine Richland. Uh, thank you for making it this far. And I hope we have a great round today. Fourthly, I'd like to thank my partners, Jonathan and Evelyn. Um, it's been so great to debate with you all this year. Um, and I've really enjoyed it. And coming on this trip, it's really a great culmination of our experiences. Uh, fifthly, I'd like to thank our coach, Alex, who also was my old debate captain. Um, you've really helped me a lot ever since I met you as a freshman. You've really inspired me to um, learn more about debate and participate in the activity more. And honestly, I don't think I would be here without you. 
Um, sixth of all, I'd like to thank my friends from Bergen County, Caitlin, Hannah, Christine, and Max. Um, Y'all were so chill yesterday. It was great talking to y'all and connecting with you. Um, uh, it was really unfortunate that we had to hate each other so early in the bracket. Um, yeah. And thank you as well to Extraordinary Education. We had a great round in semis. Um, yeah. So with that being said, is everyone ready? Okay. Time will begin now. In Yale, Professor Robert Triffin's groundbreaking 1959 address to the United States Congress Joint Economic Committee, he famously declared the US dollar and the entire Bretton Woods system, which made the dollar the global reserve currency in 1944, were doomed. Just over a decade later, this warning became reality. Bretton Woods collapsed in 1971 when the United States ran massive balance of payment deficits and US dollar liabilities held abroad exceeded US monetary gold stock. Nevertheless, the US dollar remains the world's undisputed reserve currency to this day. This has resulted in the United States running the largest current account deficit globally. Indeed, with the U dollar making up 61% of global currency reserves and 66 countries pegging their currencies to it today, a plethora of critics of dollar hegemony have argued it has afforded the United States the ability to borrow extravagantly and given rise to precarious circumstances threatening the stability of the world economy. With this in mind, we strongly affirm that on balance, the hegemony of the US dollar is detrimental to the world economy. Before we begin, we would like to introduce one observation. Policies must be assessed in the context of alternatives. For example, if a government decides to save 100 people instead of 1,000, we cannot say it made a good decision. Even though saving 100 people is good in isolation, the government made, on balance, a bad decision because they gave up the opportunity to save thousands more. With that, our first contention is special drawing rights. Special drawing rights, or SDRs, are an international reserve asset formed by the IMF to supplement existing reserve currencies of the global economy. Countries exchange SDRs with the IMF for hard currency using exchange rates based on a basket of different major currencies, including the dollar, euro, and yuan. In 1971, as the Bretton Woods system under the gold standard collapsed, countries looked for an alternative. SDRs were the foremost option. In fact, twos of Columbia University writes, OPEC nearly pegged the price of oil to SDRs, which would have entirely precluded the existence of petrodollar dominance and the resurgence of the dollar as the global reserve currency. Unfortunately, the IMF voting structure gave the US veto power over SDR issuance, allowing them to halt the transition away from dollar hegemony towards SDRs. This is key, as the alternative to dollar hegemony was and still is SDRs, a far better reserve currency, further exemplified by the widespread support for SDRs across the globe and the implementation of aid packages by the G20. This is because they provide stability. Homepage of the Cleveland Fed explains the value of SDRs is based on multiple currencies, meaning they're inherently more stable than the dollar as fluctuations in a single currency would not significantly impact the value of the SDR and thus the global economy. This is key, as dollar volatility has historically rattled emerging markets, risking financial ruin, which happens in two ways. Firstly, when the dollar is strong, emerging market economies suffer. The Bank for International Settlements concludes a strong dollar is bad news for emerging market economies because Barton Stein of Bloomberg reports over two thirds of debt in developing countries are held in dollars. Thus, to pay off debt, countries have to convert their local currencies to dollars. When the value of dollars increases, each one becomes harder to obtain, and thus the debt burden on these economies surges overnight. Specifically, between 1990 and 2020, every 1% increase in the value of the dollar depressed growth prospects by over 0.3%. For example, in 2018, when the dollar's value spiked, Shapiro finds the value of Turkey's debt grew to twice the size of their foreign reserves, exacerbating instability and poverty rates. The Guardian writes, increased deficits trade off with social spending, a trend seen empirically in debt riddled developing nations like Mozambique, Congo, and Sierra Leone. Critically, social safety nets drive social and economic mobility as they reduce poverty, cushioning economic downfall. Overall, the World Bank finds 2.5 billion people around the world rely on social safety nets globally, 650 million of which are in the poorest 20%. When the dollar falls, crisis also ensues. The best example of this comes from the Great Recession. Domi Trovic of the Laffer Center explains, a weak dollar resulted in investors hedging their capital in housing, energy, and commodities. This flight from the dollar played a massive part in the severity of the 08 recession. However, in addition to this, the presence of US dollar hegemony leads to bigger asset bubbles. Because of the inherent imbalances of capital inflows and outflows caused by the US uh, massive trade deficit, Kauai of the Asian Development Bank observes massive amounts of capital funds flow from trade surplus countries back to the US, causing bubbles in the prices of real estate, stocks, and bonds. For this reason, dollar hegemony was not only a major cause in recent recessions, but also exacerbated their severity. 
Our second contention is the petrodollar. In 1971, the end of the gold standard led to an unprecedented devaluation of the dollar, leaving the US with few options. Ultimately, the only way to maintain US dollar hegemony was through the creation of the petrodollar system. Since then, the petrodollar has been at the heart of the US dollar hegemony. Indeed, the term petrodollar derives from the way diplomatic relations between the US and Saudi Arabia linked the sale of oil to the dollar through a series of negotiations and agreements from 1972 to 1977. Ultimately, Paul Antonopoulos, a doctorate research, a researcher specializing in Asian international relations, explains very simply that, quote, given Saudi oil has played the major role in the US dollar becoming the world's reserve currency, the US turned into the guarantor of the security of Saudi Arabia. Unfortunately, this system encourages the US administration to play a part in countless crises, exemplified by the mass atrocities in Yemen that we see today. The propping up of the petrodollar system through US dollar hegemony created a situation where Saudi Arabia fights proxy wars in the Middle Eastern region. Because they receive funding from the US and are shielded by American military might, Saudi Arabia fights proxy wars, including one with Iran. Glenn Carey of Bloomberg finds, in this proxy war with Iran, Saudi Arabia has disrupted 80% of food and other imports into Yemen through a naval blockade. And the BBC reports, 14 million people right now are in famine, 22 million of which are in urgent need of humanitarian aid, meaning that the UN has deemed it the largest humanitarian crisis of our time. This relationship extends past a single conflict. Hook of the Polish Institute of International Affairs blames US support for Saudi Arabian aggression, as they encourage the Saudis to make risky moves aimed at Iran, which escalates conflict. The real victims, however, aren't either of the warring nations, but rather neighboring countries. Indeed, Thrall of Cato confirms, arms sales embolden Saudi war hawks to start conflicts throughout the region, creating proxy wars that have destabilized the region and killed millions throughout the past few decades. In conclusion, the numerous harms of dollar hegemony in all the past, present, and future are all rooted in historical precedents. History is the most precise and objective evaluator of the impact of the dollar hegemony on the world economy and points unmistakably towards an unsound system of destruction. By destabilizing flashpoint regions and eliminating SDRs, the world order created by the US dollar has created widespread inefficiencies and has ultimately hurt the global economy rather than helped it. A system implementing the US dollar as a reserve currency is doomed to fail. Any form of unilateral reserve currency takes on far too much burden, creating the large account deficits present in the US today. Instead, a multilateral reserve currency, such as one provided by an SDR reserve currency system, would create uniformity and efficiency in the global economy overall, promoting policies that benefit each and every nation around the world, ensuring that each and every nation receives the aid that they need. Thus, we are more than proud to affirm. Thank you very much. We will now have the opening statement from the negative team for eight minutes. All right. Uh, is this working? Yes. Yes, okay. it is. All right. Uh, really quickly before we begin, I just want to give a couple thank yous. Uh, first and foremost, I want to give a shout out to Callie Stoltz, Tag Mana, and Matthew Farmer. They're the other half of our team. They're not currently debating with us, but these past nine months have required us to be meeting on a daily and weekly basis to get these arguments done. And we have been so much better as a team, but also had a much more fun experience because of you guys. So. Thank you so much for you guys. Uh, second, I want to thank our debate coach, uh, Mr. Baiko. He's been debating for decades and has coached us in debate for uh, over six years now. What, he's been incredibly helpful, not just that, as well as an English teacher, improving our ability not only to critically think and enjoy English, but to be uh, better people in general. So thank you, Mr. Baiko. Uh, finally, I want to thank our parents for continually supporting us and being very, very patient with the long nights we've had working on this case. Um, thank you very much, Mom and Dad. Um, and a mission age, also thank. Uh, your parents as well. Uh, finally, we'd want to thank the Brewer Foundation. Um, to some of this pandemic in a single word, it would not be fun. Uh, you know, two years of digital pandemic and two years of digital tournaments have been incredibly um, slow and boring to sit in the same room. So the ability not only to come to New York, but on an all expense pay trip has been amazing to debate a topic that is one of the most interesting and pressing the world. So thank you very much. Um, all right, and so with that, I will begin the negative constructive. Dollar hegemony's steady hand has stabilized the world economy to unprecedented economic growth for nearly 80 years. Under dollar hegemony, for the first time in history, more people climbed out of extreme poverty than fell into it, half of all humanity reached the middle class, and global trade increased 300-fold. Because of this, Amish, Andrew, and I negate. On balance, the hegemony of the United States dollar is detrimental to the world economy. First, 
We define dollar hegemony as the dominance of the dollar in the world economy through its role as the, world, as the most commonly held reserve currency, but also most widely used currency for international trade, with 80% of international trade making up the dollar. This part of the definition is key, as trade is essential to a currency hegemony's effect on the world economy. Second, we have two key observations. First, U.S. dollar hegemony is different from overall U.S. hegemony. Our opponents claim that dollar hegemony has fueled the Yemen crisis as America has protected Saudi Arabia and bolding them. The issue with this argument is that it is non-unique. As regardless, Saudi Arabia would be trading oil and funding this war as this is a regional conflict funded by oil sales that could come in any denominated currency. At the end of the day, petrodollar is simply the pricing of oil in dollars. Instead, it is the physical asset of oil that is important for this crisis. We also agree with the affirmative framework, which is that in order for dollar hegemony to be considered detrimental, we must compare it to the most likely alternative. However, we disagree with the proposed alternative of special drawing rights for two key reasons. First, according to the International Monetary Fund themselves, the SDR is an international reserve asset created by the IMF to supplement the official reserves of its member countries. The SDR is not a currency. It is a potential claim on the freely usable currencies of IMF members. The SDR itself is not designed to be a reserve currency, but a supplement to a global reserve, such as the dollar. This brings us to our second key response. SDRs structurally cannot be the next reserve as they lack liquidity, and there is no free market to exchange them. For these reasons, research by Zhang Ningzhuang finds that the SDR will never be the main international reserve asset, not in the current form or in any future form. Further, SDRs can't be held by private entities or individuals, but only IMF members. And this is key, as the vast majority of debt in the status quo is given out by private corporations. This lack of scalability means that the SDR will never be a global reserve, but remain a supplement. In the end, there's a general expert consensus that the most likely alternative system to replace the dollar in the near future is a multipolar one, where the dollar diminishes in influence and major currencies like the euro, yen, renminbi rise to prominence. And for this reason, we will be comparing the status quo to that system. Contention one, global stability. As the currency hegemon, the US holds the position as the lender of last resort that mitigates recessions. Specifically, dollar hegemony has stabilized the world economy and worked to mitigate recessions, primarily first through swap lines. The Federal Reserve has become the lender of last resort, and the world turns to the dollar to obtain emergency funding. This emergency funding is provided through swap lines, with Ambadeo 11 explaining that Fed swap line swaps billions of US dollars to foreign central banks for an equivalent amount of the recipient nation's own currency. These agreements stabilize domestic markets, assure foreign investors of a nation's currency liquidity, and prevent far worse financial crises in recipient nations by ensuring that local currencies are properly backed by enough stable dollars in reserve. Unfortunately, in a multipolar world, countries would not have access to a central currency to provide the necessary stimulus during times of economic crisis. Delamy and Mason 11 find that with the multiple reserve currencies, control over global liquidity likely would be weakened because it would result from the uncoordinated actions of different central banks. The alternative to the current system in which the dollar depends on the, on the world is a multi-currency system in which there's no one to depend on, on them during a major financial crisis. It's historically, during the 2008 recession, the US provided over $580 billion in swap lines to the world, lifting millions out of poverty. For example, in South Korea and Singapore alone, they experienced a 6.8% and 15% increase in GDP just a year after receiving US dollar swap lines. The impact is preventing recession. Overall, I think Green 16 finds dollar hegemony's ability to limit financial crises has stabilized the world economy, with it determinizing that dollar hegemony has decreased the severity and frequency of recessions, reducing them from one every 3.5 years to one every six years. Moving on to contention two, global trade. Subpoint A, trade e efficiency. Kelly 21 finds 88% of foreign transactions are invoiced in the dollar. This means that when two foreign nations are trading, they both use a dollar to facilitate their transactions. Specifically, dollar hegemony makes trade more accessible and more efficient by first lowering exchange rate risk and transaction costs. Author James Chen writes that a central reserve currency is a foundation for global commercial transactions because it eliminates the need for different nations to exchange among many different currencies, thus minimizing exchange rate risk, the potential to lose money from value fluctuations between a local and foreign currency. Additionally, the dollar naturally eliminates exchange rate risks when nations anchor the value of their currency to the dollar. After anchoring, Ombreo 21 finds emerging markets can easily trade on the international market. The dollar stability means anchoring stabilizes the exchange rate between countries as an anchor to the dollar provides long-term predictability of exchange rates for businesses planning. Ultimately, the Federal Reserve quantifies. Excluding the US, 50% of the world GDP in 2015 was produced in countries whose currencies are anchored to the US dollar, with the impact being an increase in global trade. A central currency like the dollar reduces the need to transact across multiple currencies, giving countries easy access to a platform for selling their goods on the international marketplace. 
Bornstein and Berg 20 conclude, the use of the dollar can make sure that the market is steadier as the elimination of exchange rate risks increase trade, especially during crises. The World Bank estimates that under dollar hegemony, free trade has increased incomes by 24% since 1990 and pulled 1 billion people out of poverty directly due to trade-driven economic gains. Subpoint B, trade blocks. Under dollar hegemony, the world has globalized and become far more integrated, leading to a free trade and lower trade barriers. Unfortunately, Delamay and Mason 11 find the most likely alternative to the dollar is a chaotic multipolar system characterized by protectionism and isolationism. They explain, a multipolar system would lead to the rise of several closed regional currency blocks. In contrast, the dollar acts as a global facilitator that is accessible to all. In a multipolar system with no true global reserve, different currencies would come to dominate certain regions of the world economy. These blocks would fracture the global system of cooperative free trade, and Magazine 20 concludes that it would result in a new era of protectionism. This is devastating. As the LA Times explains, protectionist alliances after the fall of British hegemony is precisely what destroyed two-thirds of global trade in the space of two years. A multipolar system would undercut multilateralism by making cooperation to maintain a system of global free trade seem less essential for economic prosperity. Overall, the impact is decreasing global trade. The National Bureau of Economic Research explains, expected world welfare decreases as trade blocks increase, with the World Bank quantifying a retreat from global integration creates large negative welfare effects of 9%. Finally, the third contention, global terrorism. The dollar is the most trusted and transparent currency on the market. This allows the Federal Reserve to monitor the terrorist financing activities dollar hegemony has been working on. The Journal of Peace and Economics and the Global Terrorism Index quantifies. Annual deaths due to terrorism have halved from 40,000 in 2014, leading to a decline in the economic impact of terrorism by 38%. Specifically, dollar hegemony fights terrorism in two key ways. First, financial tracking programs, or TFPTP. Currently, the U.S. Treasury Department heads TFTP, which monitors international financial transactions to identify and stop terrorist attacks around the world. Because transactions are done in the dollar, Treasury Departments have become a center for terrorist financial tracking. Unfortunately, in a multipolar world, no one actor would be able to monitor financial transactions. That is why in the status quo, the U.S. remains the only country with such a program, with even the European Union relying on the U.S. for data. And the U.S. has done exactly that, with the Treasury reporting that over 80,000 individual terrorist leads have been shared with EU authorities alone. Why is this? Well, it's because the United States is able to monitor financial records of these countries because they're in U.S. banks, with in 2002 to 2012, 12% of all terrorist plots being prevented or disrupted in some way due solely due to access gained from these U.S. banks and financial records. Because of the threat terrorism poses to the economy and the solution that dollar hegemony poses, among others, we urge you to negate. That's time. The 90-second break for the second negative speaker. Affirmative speaker. That's time. Next affirmative speaker has five minutes. Yeah. 
So before I begin my speech, I'll also try to give some thank yous, but keep it quick. So firstly, thank you to the organizers of this event, the Brewer Foundation and New York University, and the CFR who hosted us as well, and the people who worked so hard to make this possible, um, especially Ms. Sadvery, who I corresponded with via email, but also everybody else. Thank you to the judges for being here and for all that you've done in general for debate and for IPPF. Congratulations to our opponents for making it to finals and also our previous opponents for amazing rounds. Thank you to all of our parents for supporting us, but also my parents for coming out all the way out here. Um, and thank you to Alex. Like Hayden said, you are a huge inspiration and your help has been so valuable to us. And finally, obviously, to Jonathan and to Kaden. It's been, an, it's been a pleasure being in a team with you. Okay, so I'm going to start. Actually, is anyone, is, is anyone not ready for anything? Okay. Their entire case is predicated on the fact that the alternative world with multiple currencies is worse than the current one. That's fine unless there are patently superior and feasible alternatives to the dollar. There are three independent reasons SDRs are a more likely alternative than, they, than the one they propose. First is history. We've seen SDRs work in the past, in the distant past, but also in the recent one. I'll elaborate more on it later. But secondly, if SDRs are clearly the better option as opposed to sort of a multipolar economic landscape where there's no, but where there's no dominant reserve currency, it means that policymakers are probably aware of this and more likely to adopt SDRs instead of not doing anything. And third, SDRs were specifically created as a reserve currency as the value of the dollar plummeted in the 1970s, which again means that it's a better option than just inaction. Now for some examples, Kretzinger 21 says the IMF issued over half a trillion dollars, actually over $600 billion worth of SDRs in response to COVID-19 financial meltdowns, which is more than what they talk about through swap lines. In the, in the 08 recession, SDRs actually prevented a liquidity crunch, which increased the reserves of low-income countries by 19%. And again, the SDR was created specifically as a synthetic currency it was, and was so successful that within four years of its creation, the SDR was able to recover 25% of the dollar's original value. They concede what we've told you from our first speech, that SDRs were on the cusp of being widely adopted until the United States stepped in and forcibly halted that development. This is really important because if we win that SDRs are a better alternative than the status quo for a myriad of reasons, this means that you can believe every single thing they say in their first speech. They can win all of their arguments, but you can still vote for us at the end of the day because SDRs have all of the benefits of the dollar that they outline, but they don't possess the same flaws. Let's address what they've said so far. The warrant for the argument that SDRs don't, bend, don't have liquidity Equity is that they aren't backed, but in fact, we read evidence that they, uh, we read evidence that says there's no logical reasoning to support this. All fiat currencies are currently not backed. We ditched the gold standard in the early 1970s, but under an SDR dominant system, SDRs are backed by the largest economies of the world, and the confidence in this currency is absolute and greatly increases liquidity. Then they say SDRs were created to supplement reserves. Again, they were created to literally replace the dollar temporarily as its value plummeted. Let's move on to their specific arguments. First, on the United States being the lender of last resort, first you need to consider the unique harms of the Federal Reserve. A, the experts that run the Fed historically and continue to underestimate telltale signs of financial instability or overheating markets, and these failures have led to crashes in both the 1990s and the 2000s. Furthermore, Forbes writes that the Federal Reserve mismanaged the dollar and allowed it to drop 30% against other major currencies in the early 2000s, and that because of it, the world had to endure the Great Recession. Secondly, even if you don't believe that, the Federal Reserve was created long before Bretton Woods and made the long before Bretton Woods made the dollar the reserve currency, meaning that its existence and any benefits of it are non-unique. But third, again, better alternatives negate the benefit of the United States and the Fed because even if it's done beneficial things, the implicit cost means that overall it was harmful. And specifically on the idea of swap lines that were largely used during the COVID-19 pandemic, absent dollar hegemony, the Fed could provide unlimited swap lines to the IMF so that S. SDR holders can always swap them for more currency and erase any shortages. So uh, swap lines you know, aren't unique to the Federal Reserve. Other agencies can use, utilize them as well and achieve the, exactly the same effect. Let's go to their second argument about global trade. First, you can turn the argument against them. Sole reliance on the dollar makes countries uniquely susceptible to any appreciation in its values, and the consequences are disastrous, not just because of dollar-denominated debt that we discussed in our first speech, but for ex in terms of trade. For example, during the East Asian crisis in the 1990s, after countries like Malaysia and South Korea saw their currencies depreciate up to 60%, export volumes also fell drastically. And this is why The Economist ultimately concludes that a 1% appreciation in the value of the dollar translates into a 0.6% decrease in trade volume between countries and the rest of the world. 
Furthermore, in terms of transactions, as the US accounts for less and less of the world's economic production, its currency's domination of financial pr transactions actually becomes progressively more unwarranted and inefficient. And this trend is, continued to, is only set to continue into the future, making the dollar's role in the global economy more and more taxing on the efficiency of trade and loans conducted using it. In fact, recent projections predict the US's share of GDP to fall to 12% by 2050, accounting for less than one eighth of the world's economic production. As this trend continues, having transactions pegged to the dollar actually become more burdensome, increase, bur uh, burdensome increasing the number of cross exchanges between currencies and global growth is ultimately stunted. Let's go to their final argument about terrorist financing. Firstly, terrorist financing is very easily monitorable through things like offensive cyber operations and other forms of surveillance and intelligence collection. Secondly, unilateral systems are ultimately a loss, lot worse. Under SDRs, under a more multilateral world, there's actually more information sharing and improves tracking because you have information centers in multiple different countries. So if you want to improve terrorist tracking, you vote affirmative. And we'll have a 90-second preparation break. <clears throat> Maybe she got a wave going, don't you? I think we should get a wave going, don't you? Go with me. Future leaders. Woo! Okay, well, <laughs> baseball game, it's not. Stranger, it's a little bit. How are you, sir? It's not in the sir? video game. It's good to see you. It's good friend. to see you, too. You have not Until. changed in 20 years. No, no. I'm, there's no chance I'm growing up. So. <laughs> So old, 20 years old? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, everybody looks old to the youngsters. Yeah. We, we look young to each other. You have to understand. Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah I think you guys look great. <laughs> My problem is I have a mirror. <laughs> I think I need to get rid of all the mirrors. You use it, huh? <laughs> Wide angle lens. I'll tell you, David, who has not changed in 20 years. I'll tell you who has not changed in 20 years. Hey. No, you're right. You're right. You Best looking guy right. I've ever seen in real life. <laughs> All right. So just a couple of quick thank yous once again. I'd like to thank uh, Callie, Matthew, Andrew, Mr. Baiko, my parents, of course, and then Andrew and uh, Miles. Thank you. I wouldn't, couldn't be up here without you guys. Of course, thank you to Brewer Foundation, IPPF, CFR, and let's get into it. Start off with an overview. The thesis of our case is simple. While the dollar may be imperfect, when you look to the broader picture, the dollar is on net beneficial. The alternative is a trade block world that splinters global trade without the stable guiding hand of the dollar. A world without the dollar is a world without stability and a world without free trade. In a multi-currency system, there is no one to depend on during a major financial crisis, while the U.S. uses swaps to mitigate recessions and save economies. With this overview, the most important thing in this round is going to be, is going to be evaluating what is the most likely alternative to the U.S. dollar hegemony. Let's go over their responses about SDRs. Let's start off with their uh, historical analysis that they give you. This is flawed because they try to tell you that the IMF prevented OPEC from using the uh, SDRs. The issue is the IMF actually had no say in this. OPEC itself chose to peg themselves to the dollar as opposed to the SDR because it was more stable and developed. But second judge, turn all of their arguments. They try to tell you that the US is going against SDRs, but they're ignoring the fact that US leadership in the IMF led to the largest allocation of SDRs in history. The US Congress approved the use of SDRs just a year into COVID, representing the largest ever allocation of 456 billion SDRs. So the saying that the US hegemony and leadership is stopping SDR allocations is not happening like they say it is. But second judge, you also delink this because they fundamentally misunderstand the use of the SDRs in the global economy. According to the IMF itself, the people who release SDRs, quote, the SDR is an international reserve asset to supplement the official reserve of member countries. 
Another quote, the SDR is not a currency. The SDR itself is not designed to be the global reserve currency. It is meant to supplement other reserves, such as the dollar. And this brings me to my third key response, which is that the SDR cannot structurally be the next reserve. This is because A, it lacks liquidity, and B, there is no free market to exchange the SDR. Once again, it's not a currency. And third, and finally, because the SDR is released by the IMF, only IMF countries have access to the SDR. The SDR can't be held by private entities or individuals. This is important because the vast majority of debt and loans given out are by private corporations. So what you're going to be seeing is the SDR is no world going to be the next global asset. With that established, let's go to the best piece of evidence in this round, which is Delami and Masoon 11 from the Danish Institute of International Studies. In their research paper that called Prospects for a Multipolar International System, they analyzed three potential scenarios. A, continued dollar hegemony. B, a multipolar world where multiple currencies rise, or trade blocks, and C, SDRs. They find that the second scenario of multiple trade blocks is, trade blocks is the most likely scenario to happen. This is because they find in the SDR situation it would require nations to overcome the resistance to subordinate their monetary sovereignty to an international authority. Because nations want to maintain their monetary sovereignty and don't want to go under one international FDR, that is why they're going to resist that, and the most likely alternative is going to be the rise of trade blocks that we talk about. With that established, let's go on to their second contention about uh, Saudi funding. The biggest issue with this problem is that it's entirely non-unique. Let's clarify this debate and talk about what the petrodollar actually is. Petrodollar is the pricing of oil specifically in the US dollar. Our opponents seem to misunderstand petrodollar as all trade of oil, but the physical asset of oil is what's crucial for Saudi Arabia to fund their war, not the fact that it's priced in the dollar. In a world with or without USD hegemony, Saudi Arabia will continue to trade oil just in a different currency, meaning that they'll still be able to continue the war in Yemen and none of their impacts materialize. But second, let's go on to their claim where they say the US is fundamentally dependent on the petrodollar and oil. This is flawed because Baker 19, who tells you that the use of dollar and dollars in international oil transactions increases overall US dollar demand by only a tiny fraction. Additionally, America's recent transformation into a net energy exporter has reduced any need for capital inflows from the petrodollar recycling system. Hence, U.S. support for oil in Saudi Arabia is not caused by petrodollar recycling, but rather a multitude of other factors unrelated to dollar hegemony. Judges, once again, we must keep look at the scope of this debate. We are focusing specifically on the effects of a currency hegemon. The U.S. supporting Saudi Arabia is due to us wanting to maintain, uh, keep checks on Iran, us wanting oil. None of it has to do with the petrodollar or the use of dollar hegemony specifically. And third and finally, the affirmative second reason is that Saudi control of OPEC and by extension of the oil trade and supply compels the U.S. to fund the regime, but once again this bears no relevance to dollar hegemony. Saudi control of the oil supply would persist regardless of what currency oil trade is denominated in. Now let's go over their responses to our case. The biggest response that they give us on trade blocks is that it doesn't matter, and even in their world, there's going to be being fractured trade. The issue is, as soon as you take out SDRs, you recognize that in a multi multipolar world, the global trade of free trade that we see today would be splintered because of the loss of a global facilitator, which is what the dollar does. For these reasons, negate. All right. Thanks, everybody. That. Um concludes the opening and second speeches by both teams. For the next 12 minutes or so, we will have team cross-examination. Uh, we'll start with the affirmative, asking questions of the negative and vice versa, and we'll go back and forth. Uh, captains, help me out so I don't have to get involved with this. Just make sure that everybody answers a question and everybody asks a question. Make sure that happens before somebody answers twice or asks twice. Does that make sense? Okay. So with that, affirmative, a question for the negative. Okay. Um, so on our argument about the petrodollar, um, so basically, essentially in like the 60s and the 70s, closer to the closer to what happened or why did the petrodollar get formed and what did the U.S. do and what did Saudi Arabia do in order to uh, bring the, uh, the petrodollar to its prominence that it has today? Sorry, could you repeat the question? What happened in the 1900s that between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia that brought the petrodollar to its dominance that it has today? Sure, the U.S. agreed to peg the po or Saudi Arabia agreed to peg the price of oil to the USD, but that's not as relevant today. As our evidence from Baker tells you today, the petrodollar itself is not what keeps maintains U.S. hegemony, as it makes up only a tiny demand. So, regardless of whether oil is priced in the dollars, USD hegemony would persist. Okay, that's fine. 
All right, so I guess I'll ask the first question. In regards to the fact that the U.S. issue the largest allocation of SDRs, approved the issuing of the largest allocation of SDRs, how are they blocking the use of SDRs in international transactions? We're not saying the United States is a horrible actor by blocking the use of SDRs right now. We're saying that historically SDRs were on track to take to sort of overtake the U.S. dollar and become the world's reserve yeah. currency, but the United States stopped it because they wanted to maintain dollar hegemony. It, your response doesn't actually respond to the argument the that we were making. The second like, thing to consider is that um, SDRs, as, it, as they are right now, are sent in aid packages, which is what the U.S. did like a few years ago. Uh, but the system that we're advocating for is not the use of SDRs as an aid package, but rather it's the use of SDRs as reserves in central banks. Um, so it's not the same idea that y'all are talking about. Question from the affirmative to the negative. How did the United States regain confidence in its currency, the U.S. dollar, uh, and regain hegemony after abolishing the gold standard um, if it wasn't the petrodollar? Like, what factors r resulted in the confidence in the dollar that we see today? Right, so we saw that initial pegging partially based off the petrodollar, but it was also based off the market forces in general. And when the U.S. decided to switch to a fiat currency, it was also the idea that we are one of the largest economies and one of the most stable backers through the reliable use of the Federal Reserve. Um, we have to look, though, this has been 50 years since the switch from the gold standard to the new fiat current system we see now. And what we see is if petrodollar simply is the idea of exchanging oil in a currency, the physical asset itself is what's most important, not the currency it's being exchanged in. Now, I have a question for you. You talk about the ability of the SDR to replace uh, dollar hegemony, but if F SDRs can't be given between corporations or individuals and only be given by IMF members, how could this actually uh, change the international trade that we see under dollar hegemony? Yeah, so I think there's like a lot of clarification that has to happen here. Um, we're not proposing that SDRs are used for like day-to-day -day inter like transactions between people, but rather we're saying that SDRs would pr replace the United States as the largest reserve currency. That allows things like, for example, when you talk about things like regional currencies, that allows those to proliferate in a far more sustainable manner, and we're telling you that that on net would be more beneficial. Question from the affirmative to the negative. Let's talk about this idea of trade. I think two key crucial ideas that go conceded are that A, the dominance of the dollar actually decrease on net, and B, that um, in the long term, using the US dollar for transaction ends up being ineffective, right? So in this world with, um, so how does, having, how does having the US dollar in the long term make trade more sustainable or more, more open? Andrew, why don't you take this? Yep. All right. So global trade, 88% of it is invoiced in the dollar. So if any two countries trade with each other, they go through the dollar to stabilize their exchange rate and avoid exchange rate risks. On the contrary, if you look to a multipolar world where there's multiple currencies, you're going to see more regional currency blocks where they trade in one currency in one region, which ultimately decreases overall global trade. We're saying that the U.S. dollar inherently, because it's the central currency, facilitates larger, broader global trade and integrates the global market. Okay, question for the neg from the negative to the affirmative. So I guess I'll ask this one. So you guys talk about the harms of both appreciation and depreciation. Would you agree that this is non-unique to the dollar and all currencies go through this? And in fact, the dollar is one of the more stable currencies out there. So the difference is that when you have a basket of currencies in the SDR, the volatility or the fluctuations in one currency don't have as large of an impact because not every single, because not every single other currency is pegged to it, right? So if you had a basket, even if the dollar sort of appreciates one day or depreciates the next, there are four other currencies in the basket that wouldn't be fluctuating the same way at the same time. Affirmative? Um, so on your whole argument um, about you lean how- in the microphone. I'm not sure yeah. that's working. So on the SDRs argument, you talked about a lack of liquidity. Um, so insofar as SDRs aren't used for actual transactions, why does liquidity of the assets actually matter? Well, you need a liquid like currency or reserve to be able to be freely exchanged in order to get this currency to be able to use for trade. Okay. All right. So touching on liquidity, because SDRs are not actually backed up by anything, there's not even printed money for them, and they're not a medium of exchange, creating SDRs doesn't create more total liquidity for the global monetary system, since it's just a potential claim on a currency. 
you're not actually issuing more liquidity to the global market, how are you solving the problem of liquidity shortages during recessions? Yeah, so um, I read the exact same article that you keep citing over and over again, and what it says is essentially, right now, the SDR isn't backed, which is why it doesn't increase liquidity. First of all, that means that all fiat currency is technically not going to increase liquidity, but that makes absolutely no sense because as long as there's confidence in that fiat currency, it can still be applied. But second of all, and more importantly, we're saying that his, if we do create a system in which SDRs are dominant, that would, if anything, inflate the amount of confidence in that and increase the stability and increase the liquidity coming from that. That's why Robert, that's why Triffin, for example, the person that we cite at the beginning of our very speech, right, who brought up this entire dilemma in the first place, tells you SDRs are one of the best solutions to solving for this imbalance that we talk about caused by US dollar hegemony. Okay, um, so on this idea about exchange rate losses, you're telling me that countries, for example, like let's say, uh, China's trading with India, right? And they're going to trade in U.S. dollars. China has to change their money into U.S. dollar, and India has to trade their money into U.S. dollar. Isn't that the exact same exchange rate losses if everyone's going to change through? You're just adding a middleman, right? Or how does that work? How do you so decrease the exchange rate losses? Here's the fundamental difference. The dollar is one of the most stable currencies out there. So looking at another example, if India had to trade with Zimbabwe, India would not want to uh, take the risk of trading in the Zimbabwean currency, and that's why the dollar uniquely increases trade. Because when you have a middleman that is stable, both countries have access to one stable currency to trade in. When it, in the other example with two nations and there's an unstable currency, that's where you see the exchange rate increase and the volatility come into play. So I have a question. Um, pivoting to global terrorism, we argue that with the idea to centralize all of the financial system in the U.S., we allow to better monitor terrorist financing and limit the detriment that terrorism has to the economic economy. Uh, your only response to this is by spreading out to multiple different information centers, we'd better track terrorism. Wouldn't you agree this would actually make it harder to track terrorism as we'd be relying on multiple different actors to um, monitor it instead of just single... That's USA. not my only response. My main response was actually that the role of dollar hegemony, the role that dollar hegemony plays in sort of tracking terrorist activities and terrorist finance is very, very negligible because there are many other ways to conduct in uh, conduct intelligence gathering and surveillance, for example, through offensive cyber operations. That's how. That's one potential way you can freeze the assets of terrorists. So, Question from the affirmative to the negative. So going back to this example about uh, like global trade, um, so let's say we're talking about like Zimbabwe trading with like Russia or something like that. So why does the stability of the currency matter if I'm simply switching like a few like a couple thousand dollars to like say Russia switches like a couple thousand like Russian dollars to the, the Zimbabwean currency and then just gives it in the transaction right? Like why would stability matter in that like instant transaction? It's not like yeah. So that's the entire concept of exchange rate volatility. The way you are able to fund for these transactions, you have to buy bonds or buy the other currency, right? Because U.S. Treasury bonds are extremely available, that's why everyone buys it, that's why they transact in it. If they were to force you buy the bonds or buy the currency of the Zimbabwean currency, that is not as stable and that can fluctuate a lot more, which means it's more of a risky investment, which is why nations are less likely to do it. Question from the negative for the affirmative. All right, so let's just clear up something with SDRs. Insofar as SDRs aren't something you can issue, you can't issue like one dollar SDR in like a currency form. It's only a potential claim on a currency. If you have one SDR, you might be able to claim one dollar for it. So there's no way you can increase global liquidity, right? Because it's, it's based on the liquidity of other money. The SDR itself, issuing SDRs doesn't increase the total amount supply of global liquidity. Wouldn't you say that during recessions then, that global liquidity can't change with SDRs, meaning you'll have deeper recessions? Oh, so, so, Jonathan, you can hear that again. No, because, so, I, I think this idea, again, comes back to whether or not you can redeem your SDRs for actual, like, liquid cash. And the answer to that is, yes, you can. And, like, historically, we've seen that this is exactly what has happened. But more importantly, we would say that if an SDR dominant system came into play, that would only increase the confidence in the system and make it even more liquid, because you would just have more financial resources targeted on this. Just a few more. Question from the affirmative to the negative. Why do you need to why do you need to buy bonds in order to convert your currency into another one? Oh yeah. So that's how you just get access to a currency. It might not even be bonds, but you need to get access to the dollar, the other currency somehow. So it's just through sorry. You need to transact in that uh, currency somehow. So it might not have to be bonds, but any way to get access to that. All right, could I ask a question? Sure. So would you agree that right now the USD has hegemony? Pardon? 
Would you agree that right now the USD has hegemony? I mean, sure. Yeah. That's what we're debating, That's right? All right. And then you would agree that the largest ever allocation of SDRs also occurred this year. So I'm just trying to get a sense of your world. If SDRs are being issued at a very large scale right now, how is it different? In so so there's, a, there's a few distinctions to make. So first, in our first observation, the argument that we're trying to make in this round is that you have to consider the alternatives. Sure, in isolation, you can say that the US dollar is good because it led to this huge issuance of SDRs, but our argument is that in a, in a world run by the SDR as the reserve currency, SDR issuances would be at a much larger scale and over a much larger time period. For example, we've only seen SDRs issued like three times in history. It's like very rare for SDRs to actually be sent out to nations. Secondly, our argument is not specifically about issuances, but rather it's about the SDR being implemented as a global reserve currency, taking over the the U.S. dollar, so it's not specific to the uh, the six hundred fifty billion dollars the U.S. sent out. Got time for a quick question from the affirmative to the negative? Go fast. Um, so, like, if what other ways besides bonds are there to get currencies, right? Like, because like your entire response that you gave me two questions ago was that you need these bonds, which is why there's a bunch of like exchange rate volatility. So, like, if you don't need bonds, then why is there still exchange rate volatility? Wait, you, so that's the thing. You need to get access to the currency somehow, which is done by buying bonds, and that's where the risk comes in. Like, but you just told me you don't need bonds. But okay, that's fine. Thank you. Now we will have our panel will get in on the fun, and uh, they will direct questions to you. I will keep an eye on which side is heavier or lighter on questions and answers. So uh, with that, would invite the panel to, uh, to ask questions of these folks. <laughs> First of all, uh, congratulations to all six of you. Uh, for five years, I participated in conversations like this down at the Federal Reserve, and uh, I think you would have fit in easily. Yeah. I'd like to note that I was chair until 2007. The economy was in perfect shape when I handed it. <laughs> All right, so let me, uh, let me ask the negative this. Uh, uh, there, there was a fascinating theme that ran through much of what you said. And I would summarize it in the following elevator speech. The United States is just better than everybody else. So uh, Amish said, uh, without the hegemony of the dollar, we would not have, quote, the guiding hand of the United States, close quote. I think we're talking about the world economy not how the guiding hand manipulates things for the plutocrats of America. But that's another story. Andrew talked about the wonderful stability of the Federal Reserve. And uh, Miles talked about the uncanny ability of the United States to spot terrorists. How much is your argument at base for the hegemony of the dollar simply the equivalent of me saying only people of my faith can get to heaven based upon a kind of base triumphalism and chauvinism and elevation of the United States and its wisdom, no matter who the president is or the chair of the Federal Reserve. How much does it depend on statements like those three statements I just... Gentlemen. Yeah, I, I can take that. Um, I mean, I certainly think we acknowledge that the U.S. is a good actor, or at least our opinion, on the economic level for balancing the global economy. Um, I wouldn't say that the U.S. is perfect by any means or stretch the imagination. But when there's a currency hegemony, we would argue that the Federal Reserve, which provides transparency and stability, not just to the U.S., but the world economy, allows for economic growth. Because at its core, what the world economy is looking for is stability. So what lies down, or what's the basis of our argument, is the idea that U.S. dollar hegemony is stable. It allows for the ability to adapt from recessions and to continue economic growth. So it's basically on the idea that if we can encourage stability and transparency, then we are doing our job to benefit the world economy. Is that responsive? Is that an extension of your earlier comments or simply a repetition? I, I was asking... How much do you depend upon a virtuous United States, an efficient United States? 
I think a lot of it is separate from the specific actions of the president or the Federal Reserve. I think the fact that we have a global reserve currency in general is extremely beneficial. And the dollar itself, I think you can take it all the way back to Bretton Woods, has reliably been shown as the most stable currency. So I would argue that I'd say the currency transcends politics, right? The dollar itself is good even when the US is bad, is my argument. With David's permission, I'll ask a, a mirror image question of the negative. Um, these wonderful letters, SDR, who, who, I mean, what it is is, it's like an index fund in the stock market. It's a basket of currencies, right? You're nodding your head. We agree on that. Who's the sovereign behind it? Uh, is it the IMF? Is there, is, is there, what's backing it? With dollars, I can buy goods from a large company or services from a large country. Uh, who's behind it? Who decides when to do what? Is there a veto? Uh, because your whole case, I'm right, depends upon the superiority of SDRs run by the Wizard of Oz as opposed to the wise Americans, right? I mean, am I right in analyzing your case that way? Is that, that the nub of this debate? It's the Americans versus some unknown deity. Yeah. So um, I guess if I was going to parallel their answers, we would say that a basket of currencies is, has inherent benefits. So specifically, we would say that it increases stability and decreases things like tensions between countries. So when you see things like currency wars, that's a result of people trying to challenge things like dollar hegemony. When we've seen China do things like uh, try to hurt the US dollar and try to increase uh, the renminbi, that's like specifically something that you wouldn't see if they're all in a basket and working together. But I think secondly, uh, in terms of answering your question on who's directing it, the IMF is technically the person that directs it. And over time, we see that uh, on a daily basis, they reevaluate. And on a, I believe every five years, they reevaluate the basket as a whole. Um, if that answers your question. Just give me an antecedent for the they. That's what I'm looking for. What, who are the they? The they is the IMF, but no, no, also. No, I don't want letters. I want to uh, know who are the sovereigns that make up that entity that has something of value other than yeah. your fiat. So I, I guess, so first of all, all IMF members, uh, they allow for like, they allow for the redeeming of the SDR, if that's what you're asking. But in terms of like people who have voting power on things like, uh, like policies related to the SDR, that would be the entire IMF. Um, the people that are in the basket are the five major economies of the world, uh, the largest exporters in the world, and those are the people that are involved in the um, basket, if that answers your question. I've said enough. Okay. <laughs> I think they're on already. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Just pull it close to you. So, um, John is my mentor, and he anticipated both the questions I was going to ask, but I have variants of the two of, of, of them for each of you. So let me begin with your group. Uh, John made this point that the SDR is like a basket of currencies as opposed to, so the analogy he gave was perfect. The S&P is a basket of stocks, you can buy individual stocks, you can buy the basket. What is it that, you know, so you, did, you only talked about the importance of SDRs as reserve currencies. What is it that prevents people from holding the basket versus holding the individual currencies? Uh, Why do we need SDRs when people can set up their own baskets and customize their own baskets? We don't, it's nice to have an index, but I can also set up my own basket of uh, currencies. Sure. So. Uh, yeah, so there's a, there's a few reasons, right? So the first is that the IMF is more of a multilateral committee, meaning that um, the way that SDRs are, they, the way that they determine the exchange rates is that uh, with the basket right now, it's five different currencies. Um, each of them is weighted differently. For example, the USD has a 41% uh, like weight in the SDR calculation, whereas the Euro has a 30%, uh, and then the Chinese Yuan has like 10%. Um, so because it's multilateral, it means that all of the different economies from around the world are collaborating, and because these economies are the ones that are holding SDRs, it's really good that they have a say in what they think the SDR should be, because they're the ones that are being aided by the SDRs. So when we have these individual member states of the IMF contributing to the discussions, it means that um, the policies that the IMF enacts are going to help the global economy as a whole become better. 
And so it's not that other actors can't create their own baskets, but that SDRs are the most probable option because they are issued by the IMF, which is one of the most legitimate actors and one of the most legitimate economic actors. If some other countries were to create their own basket of currencies, it wouldn't necessarily be used by the rest of the world. So again, SDRs are just the most probable or most feasible option. So I'm, now I'm going to get back to the point that SDR is simply a claim on the basket. Sure. I can just buy the basket directly and get the same claim. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that's the point I'm asking. So why, suppose I won't want to hold a different weightage. Oh, so you're asking what is, what? So I'm saying, why did you choose SDRs as the alternative when countries can anyway choose their own reserve currencies? That's the question I'm asking. So I said, I think something very unique about SDRs is that they are technically not a currency. And I think that is a big part of how we're able to solve for the liquidity issue that we talk about in the Triffin Dilemma. Um, so like if they were hard currency, that would mean that there's some country that's taking the burden of, of having those trade imbalances and those debt imbalances, which causes issues later down the line. Um, and having that, like I guess, artificial currency is part of, um, I guess, like solving that issue artificially. Other questions? Did you have one for Renee? I, sure. I do have, and again, this was, it's related but distinct, but I'm going to ask the question this way. Monetary policy was not mentioned often here, but monetary policy is what ultimately drives, monet, you know, government policy is what often drives currency uh, values. U.S. monetary policy, U.S. fiscal policy, U.S. government policy is based on what is good for the U.S., not what is good for the world. So your argument that it has so far been good almost has a feeling of post hoc or go propter hoc kind of argument. What is the link? Why is it that Federal Reserve policy and US government policy based on US interests are actually good for the world? So I think one of the really important things to mention is the stat that we read at our end of our second contention that 75% of the world's GDP comes from nations that have pegged their currency to the dollar. And what that means is that these nations' currencies, whenever the dollar moves in value, these nations' currencies also move in value. And I think that solves back for a lot of issues that they talk about, such as appreciation and depreciation, because that means that when the US goes through these cycles, it also impacts these other nations. The US, in this regard, has become a leader, where other currencies also follow them in the same regard, and when they peg their value to the dollar, and the US acts in its interest to maintain the stable value, it also helps these other nations as well. So I'd argue the way the world economy is set up, what often benefits the US, often benefits the rest of the world, but beyond that, I think you also see that the US also takes the initiative to help the rest of the world separately. And you could see this in 08, when they gave out these swap lines, when they gave out $700 billion in dollar liquidity to the rest of the world to help mitigate the impact of recession there. So I'd say both things. Not a, whatever helps the U.S. usually helps the rest of the world, and B, the U.S. also takes separate steps to ensure global stability. You want to follow up? That's Sorry, fine. just one uh, comment. Mm -hmm. The EU accounts for over 25% of world GDP, and China accounts for another 20%. So how can 75% of world GDP be pegged to the dollar? And this accounting I think Amish was saying that 50% of world GDP is anchored to the dollar. So in 90% of months, uh, it fluctuates less than 2% against the dollar. And so the U.S. itself is like 25% of world GDP, so it came with 75%, right? And China, the renminbi, is kind of anchored to the dollar in some ways, but um, as it doesn't change that much in value most of the time, but that's where the 50% number mm -hmm. comes from. Okay, um, lots of things I also wanted to ask were just discussed. So I will ask um, <clears throat> to a bit more <coughs> technical questions to both of the teams for the affirmative. Um, you've discussed a lot why you believe um, that SDRs are more most likely alternative as well as why it is the better alternative in your opinion. I would simply ask for a clarification. Do you believe that SDRs would behave similarly or differently in the absence of dollar hegemony? So I'm just asking for your characterization of a situation that you are drawing some impacts, harms out of. So that, that would be just to clarify what exactly do you believe will the situation be in the absence, would the situation be in, with the SDRs in the absence of USD hegemony? 
Yeah. Um, so I, I guess the answer to that question is yes, they would be different, and we think. Uh, in many ways, they would. This would increase multilateral cooperation between the major exporters that we talk about that are in the basket. So essentially, I guess a big part of uh, economic policy and foreign policy is tying is making sure that I guess you're receiving your incentives, and so are I guess the people that you're working with. And by aligning those interests, by working together on that basket currency, because you're all reliant on that as your foreign exchange reserves, um, that would I guess increase the confidence in. The uh, SDR overall, and I guess there are potential other changes as well because originally it was deployed as something that could have been used as the next currency, but uh, in general it would remain largely the same, but um, increase in terms of like stability and confidence. Okay, um, the question I have for negative is a very simple clarification: what exactly your strategy is? Very technically, I'm asking. Um, are you saying that if the judges decide that um, SDRs are more, more more likely alternative, are you losing this round? So is is your only way to lose the round the fact that we as judges accept um, your multipolar world in terms of currency? So there are two burdens. A, they have to prove that um, SDRs be most likely, but the second key thing is they have to show that it's better is like the key thing. So it's both things that, I think I would argue SDR is not the most likely outcome. You're gonna see regional blocks. And then the second thing they also- I understand. Improve. My question is, if I as a judge decide that SDRs are more likely alternative, does that mean that you automatically lose the debate or are you also fighting um, on this field, on this level? We would say no, because even if you find SDRs are the most likely alternative, if they are worse or more detrimental to the economy than any presumed detriments you'd have uh, during the status quo of dollar hegemony, then this would also have to be proven for you to Okay, can you then quickly name a few reasons, constructive reasons, why uh, <clears throat> uh, the U.S. dollar hegemony is still better than SDRs? Yeah, so the first thing is the USD is the most stable. In fact, over the past year, the USD on the stability index moved from only 96.3 to 97, making it one of the most stable in the developed world. If the SDR, when you combine other more unstable currencies, such as the yuan, where you know China artificially devalues their currency, if you have the US as the most stable and you're combining that with other more unstable currencies, you're inherently still increasing in stability. So the fact that the US is the best option out there means that SDRs are still worse. Thank you. Next. Hi. Um, I have a question about the alternatives um, to dollar hegemony. Um, the negative, you're making the argument that m multipolarity um, is the most likely. Can you explain the internal link scenario between uh, a lack of U.S. dollar hegemony and the multipolar, multipolar impacts you talk about? All right. So right now, the U.S. is the central reserve currency, central transaction currency. So we would say in a world without USD hegemony, countries would focus on a regional currency. So there would start being blocks. And trade would be conducted through these blocks in one area, mainly in the regional currency instead of a worldwide currency. And that's where we impact to decrease global trade and instead more regionalization and isolationism from the world stage. For the affirmative, um, you've talked about the SDR as the alternative uh, and the IMF as the sort of arbiter of that, of that alternative. Uh, what happens to non-IMF member actors that uh, might want access to currency or, or the alternative? Um, so I think one important thing to consider is that um, the goal of the IMF is not to shut out current countries that are not in their system, but rather um, I would argue that under a system of SDR as the reserve currency, they would be attempting to increase multilateralism through adopting forms with these countries that are not currently in the IMF system, that currently do not have access to SDRs, um, which is another benefit of having an SDR system because they're able to uh, promote their systems because naturally they don't have, these smaller countries don't have access to the US dollar anymore, so they uh, probably would want to access the SDR as the reserve currency, which improves incentives to join the IMF and improves dialogue between countries, which is beneficial not only for the economy, but for the political sphere of the world as well. And on top of that, as sort of another layer of argumentation, even if you, you know, choose not to believe what Caden just said, there are 190 countries in the IMF. So the argument that you know, anyone who's not part of the IMF wouldn't have access to SDRs is a um, very minor concern at the end of the day.
Thank you. Yes, thank you. So, I have a problem. I'm going to have to vote in a few minutes, affirmative or negative. And <clears throat> I'm struggling to figure out which way my ballot goes. So let me start with the, the negative. Essentially, is your argument dollar dominance is the status quo, and the status quo is pretty good? Yes. That's it, right? And while the, dominor, the dollar has been dominant as the reserve currency, trade has increased, poverty has gone down worldwide, and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Is that your case? Yeah. Yes. Okay, got it. <laughs> that I can deal with. So now... You're struggling. I understand that. So now you're struggling to get my ballot. Okay? Tell me if, we are, if your alternative world is SDRs. Is that it? Mm -hmm. But, and I'm not going to be as cruel as my colleague over here to the right <laughs> and, and talk about the Wizard of Oz, because the Wizard of Oz is the IMF. The, you, you, you want a world where there's no longer dollar dominance, but we have SDRs, and that's pegged to this basket that is indexed by the IMF. Right. And you think that's better? Correct. Do I have it? Yes. OK, good. And you essentially like that more than dollar dominance, yes, because that's multinational. Correct. Yeah, which brings about more benefits. Uh, it, like the in essence, because it's multilateral, it brings about a Payton, lot. Of, lean into your mic, please. We're all uh, having trouble hearing. Because you. it's multilateral, it brings a lot of benefits. For example, it's a more stable uh, reserve currency than the U.S. dollar. Um, because as we explained in our case. Uh, even if one currency, for example, if the USD were to crash in the in the ne uh, negative world, the uh, entire world economy would be in disarray because the US dollar is the sole reserve currency. Uh, so if it has a lot of fluctuations, then a lot of other nations, uh, because of globalization, a lot of other nations are also going to be harmed. Whereas under an SDR system, since there's a basket of currency, even though the US dollar may be fluctuating, all the other currencies are balancing it out and making sure that the value of the SDR does not fluctuate too extremely, which means that as a whole, the global economy under an SDR system is on net more stable. But you want me to go to a, mate, to a new world that's laden with assumptions about what the future may be. Is that right? I don't believe that it's laden with assumptions, so... Okay, what... T show, and this is key. Direct me to the evidence you have of someone or that, that lays out the benefits of this new world. In Just direct me to that evidence that's in your case. In the 1970s, after the gold standard collapsed and the value of the dollar plummeted and there was a large shortage of dollars, the SDR was created as a synthetic reserve currency for the sole purpose of replacing the dollar. And it was on track to do so until the United States forcibly intervened. Um, and I also do want to point out that the responses that have been made to SDR so far have been regarding the feasibility of it as, a, as an alternative, as a replacement to the US dollar, but there's never been any engagement regarding the merits of the SDR at all in this debate. So, so far, the benefits of the SDR in terms of multilateralism, in terms of more stability, have completely gone uncontested. But dollar dominance continued even after the, the, the collapse that you just talked about, correct? Correct. Right. Due okay, to so the, and this, this is, you can tell I'm spending a little more time with you because I want to give you a chance for my ballot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when the negative was citing all of these positives that have occurred over the last, I don't know, however many decades, where 
the dollar has been dominant, are they misleading us as to all of those things yes. that got better? Yes. Show me that. Tell, yeah. Direct me towards your proof of that. All right. Um, so I think the, the most telling sign is that they give you the broadest piece of evidence they could find. They just bring up, for example, evidence from maybe the World Bank or um, the UN that says overall poverty has decreased. But none of it proves causation, and none of it says that all this development is because of the US dollar. The best that they can do is maybe that trade increased growth, but they don't even prove that the US dollar created that trade, and that trade created that growth. So we're saying that overall, their linkages are very shaky, but also, I guess, like something very important to point out is that we do provide a lot of historical evidence as well that shows that it would have been a far better development plan if we stuck with SDRs. For example, we provide historical evidence indicating that SDRs were the more stable currency, which would have prevented things like, for example, banking crises in developing countries or caused things like bubbles to not have existed or grown as large as they did. Mr. Moderator, may I have one more? Of course. So to the negative. Um, he can have as many as he wants. He's, <laughs> this is the guy that pays for it. Look at his suit. This suit. <laughs> Look, I'm trying to figure this out because I was a theater major. I mean, you know. As you can see. Selena Gomez is on the way to explain <laughs> synthetic CDOs to us. So. So, so they just said your proof is full of soup. Respond to that. Do you have a response? Yeah, we do. So the first thing is, what we actually point to is evidence and not future projections. We point to what's already happened and what you've seen happen in the past, after decades, like 70 years of dollar hegemony. For example, they say that we just give evidence that's correlational, but they ignore the actual links we give. We have experts who tell you that dollar hegemony uniquely has created an accessible currency that has facilitated trade. And then we combine this evidence with the fact that free trade has gone up 24% since dollar hegemony. We're not, it's impossible to find something. Hey, hey, Michelle, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you, and I apologize for being rude. Sorry. But direct me to that evidence. The World the, Bank. The, 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 say again? World Bank. Anything else? Uh, we also have evidence from uh, the IMF that talks about increasing free trade and how that's all happened under dollar hegemony. And, and, and those studies were that you're citing to were concluded when? They were comparing uh, the trade before USD hegemony and after it was put in. And it tells you that it increased 24%. And like they're trying to, it's impossible to get a stat that says like X percent of this was solely due to dollar hegemony, right? Like that's not a stat that exists. But what they ignore is that we also warrant our evidence. We give you the unique linkages for why how dollar hegemony creates one currency that facilitates global trade as opposed to having to like splinter and go uh, and transact among many different ones. So I think our evidence and warranting combined with the evidence is sufficient. So you know, what well, we perform to specific examples, you know what you're getting, but you don't know what you're getting in the affirmative world. So I think the affirmative world is more of a shot in the dark, while the negative world is a bullseye. Thank you both. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want more questions? We, we have three minutes and sort of something of torture <laughs> remaining, so Anybody? if you have additional questions. Anybody? I, I, Please do. Any irresistible urges by my colleagues? Please do. All right, so I, I, start, I started off this conversation uh, with a certain metaphor, and I, I, I want to probe the affirmative to see if we can get Brother Bill's ballot and maybe mine. You did not accept an invitation, and it's too late now, that I offered, <coughs> which was for you to come in with a different strategy and say, you know, they're going to just let the greedy people that run America run the world. We got a better strategy. He used the word multilateralism. You've got a multi currency basket, but you didn't argue the IMF is going to have a different strategy that drives what it does. So we're now into the technical comparison between the basket and a very well-backed currency in a relatively uncorrupt nation with a lot of regulation that makes our stock markets, for example, very attractive to investors around the world and our bonds attractive. They've got that, okay? 
you've got the fact that they haven't convinced any of us up here, I think, of causality. Good point. Okay. But here we face, and I'm sorry, I don't mean it as a pejorative, the wizard here. And, and I'm wondering, I'm going back for an example, and if you can produce this for me, you may just on this one fact get me. You're saying that an index fund is better than a hedge fund because an index fund runs you know, like a market index. Well, guess what? When the market starts going down, the whole damn index tends to go down. And when you look at 2009, when the United States ran into trouble, there wasn't any ameliorative effect, uh, effect from the euro or, 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 or anything like that. They move in the same direction. That's the massive assumption behind your kind of mutual fund approach. So I want to know what it is that, you know, let's call this currency the umlaut. Okay, so it's the umlaut. Why is the umlaut better than the dollar? Why aren't they right that this is all speculation? I think a lot is going to turn in our minds on that. Probably our last opportunity, so far away. <laughs> No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jonathan, do you want, you want me to go? Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess the answer to that question is that um, it's – so I guess this index fund, if you're going to think about it in that manner, is based specifically on the five strongest currencies in the entire world. What we know is that historically domestic – Excuse me. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure – I want to give you all the opportunity. Yeah. First of all, am I right in characterizing your argument – hinges on this, right? I mean, I mean the, the, the superiority of an index fund over a single. And the dollar is 41% of your index fund. Correct. So, so, so the question now I'm asking you to do is, can you disaggregate the volatility of the elements and give me any example of where that occurred, yeah. where, where, where there would be the smoothing effect you're claiming? Yeah, so I think the, the I guess the best example is um, just in general when there tends to be if you look at, for example, everyday volatility between countries, right? What we see is that if the United States dollar goes down, we'll see other currencies go up in terms of like the evaluation, right? The difference, and that means that in a basket, that would not general, that would not affect the value of the basket, right? So theoretically, I guess even if it was true that during recessions they all suffer, we would say that first of all, it would decrease the volatility because you would still have more baskets, and that would mean that, for example, if the United States is facing a domestic crisis, it doesn't face the, it doesn't impact the basket in the same ways. But second of all, we would say that apart from those specific crises, which are in general not that common, or happen like every decade or so, every other time there are like domestic policies that cause volatility, and the United States is making some isolationist action or doing something else like that, you're not going to see volatility in the currency, which is very, very important for all these countries that, for example, have dollar-denominated debt or other things like that and creating the, the inflationary bubbles that we talk about in our case as well. We are out of that time, but I think it would be fair to, Andrew, would you like to, 30 seconds or so on, uh, on, on uh, Dr. Sexton's question, comment on? I mean, it was giving you a chance to respond to what they just said. Yeah, sure. So, because the question, we didn't have time to get it to you. In the end, we would say the world is highly hypothetical. It's not really rooted in historical evidence, like our argument is. And in reality, when you look to central banks, they already have diversified uh, reserve currencies, so they already have baskets. In their world, you're just subjecting every single central bank to the same basket and you're not actually solving for any of the issues. The dollar is uniquely the most stable, and in their world, it makes up 41% of the basket anyway, so if the dollar crashes, you're also gonna see their basket crash. So we're gonna say that. Okay. Yeah. That's good, thanks. We will now have the final two rebuttals, five minutes each, starting with the negative. You may begin now. All right. Is everybody ready? Yep. All right, then I will begin. Let's start off with an overview of the entire debate. Our thesis is really simple. 
while the dollar may be imperfect in some instances, when you look to the broader picture, the dollar is on that beneficial and has been throughout history. The alternative to the dollar is a trade block world that splinters global trade without the stable guiding hand of the dollar. A world without the dollar is a world without stability. In the end, judges, you must ask yourself two questions in this debate. First, what is the true role of the dollar in the world economy? And in these roles, is it beneficial or negative? First, let's go to the first key voting issue, which is basically the entire debate, the alternative. We give you a multipolar world that turns into trade blocks, and they give you SDRs. They have to defend SDRs on two levels. First, if it's the most likely system. And second, if that system is more beneficial than the current system of the dollar. First, let's look at if it's more likely. First, realize that the structural issues of the SDR prevent it from being the next global reserve. Financial assets cannot be the next reserve for the SDR as it lacks liquidity. There is no free market to exchange it. And considering 80% of loans are private and not issued by governments, an SDR reserve currency without a private market would be impossible for world prosperity. For these reasons, John Nuhenge finds the SDR is not a currency. There is no market, no liquidity, and its essence can be changed at the whim of the IMF. The SDR will never be the main international reserve asset, not in its current form or any future form. Third, and most importantly, the best evidence in the round is from Dalai Lama and Mason 11 from the Danish Institute of Studies. In the paper, Prospects for a Multipolar International Monetary System, they analyzed three potential scenarios. One of continued dollar hegemony, a multipolar world where multi multiple currencies rise, and a multilateral reserve currency, or the SDR. They find that the second scenario of multipolar trade blocks rising is the most likely scenario in the near future. They say that the SDR is not possible because it would require overcoming the resistance of many countries to subordinate their monetary sovereignty to an international authority or the wizard that simply doesn't exist. The desire for national sovereignty simply won't be overcome, just like how there isn't a global standing army, there also isn't a global central bank under no country's control. In fact, economist Fred Hirsch, senior advisor to the IMF, published an essay in 1974 when he found that it is generally recognized in both academic and official circles that SDRs in their present form are inadequate and secure and controlled base for the world monetary reserves. And to use SDRs, a more comprehensive SDR system would represent a substantial step toward a world central bank, which no country would ever agree to. The IMF isn't able to issue a global SDR reserve that replace other currencies. SDRs would require a completely new governance structure that all countries would be subject under. Clearly, SDRs are not the most likely system going into the future. Instead, what you would see is closed trade blocks where regional currencies dominate and global trade collapses. Now, let's, say, let's go on to why the SDRs are more harmful anyway. First, the dollar is more stable than the SDR. Countries should be able to choose the diversification of their currency reserves. Currently, central banks already do this and diversify. The SDR is functionally not solving anything and merely subjects the entire world under one system. If anything, a basket is going to go down if the dollar is going down. In their world, 41% of the SDR basket is dollar anyway. They're not solving anything. And second, SDRs are allocated based on IMF quotas meaning 3% of SDRs go to developing nations, while 70% of the liquidity goes to developed countries. And third, non-IMF members are excluded. Not only is it non-IMF countries, but more importantly, excludes the private markets and private corporations and private debt, which ultimately is the source of global finance. Realize, in the end, it's highly hypothetical, the world they claim. It's a world that isn't there and won't necessarily play out. We point out what has empirically happened under dollar hegemony. We've given out swap lines. The dollar has stabilized the world economy, and we've been able to mitigate recessions. And global trade has increased 24%, and trade-driven economic gains have pulled 1 billion people out of poverty. The current system is working, and the dollar's stable hand has guided economic prosperity for the past century and will continue to do so in the future. Their world of SDRs is simply highly hypothetical, not the most likely alternative, and instead what you would see is regional blocks that splinter global trade. Thus, negate.
final speech in the debate will be given by the affirmative. Is everyone ready? Yep. Ready. Right. We'll start time now. Our opponents do not prove causality, first of all. So even if you do believe that the world is doing good now, that does not necessarily matter. Empirics are not on their side. But furthermore, and more importantly, even if things are good right now, we are telling you that SDRs are a better alternative, which means that they could have been better. Hundreds of millions of people are still in poverty. If we could have helped the world develop in a far greater fashion, then we should have done so, and we should do so now. Insofar as that's true, let's talk about SDRs. Our opponents give a few responses, and all of them are invalidated by the end of the round. The first one is that they lack liquidity. You know that it's quite sad when their only response here comes from a blog writer with absolutely no qualifications, and that is exactly why we tell you he has absolutely no sense. We tell you that on net, all fiat currencies are not backed. However, when they are technically, when they are credible and created by, for example, huge financial institutions supported by the largest exporters, the largest economies in the entire world, that's when they are backed and that's when they are able to maintain their value. That's why liquidity is solved and that's why exactly why Robert Triffin tells you that this is the best solvency for the Triffin dilemma. Second of all, they say that SDRs are not going to be implemented because of sovereignty issues. First of all, national sovereignty is not impacted, which is why, for example, now countries are still willing to approve SDR allocations. They are not approving necessarily a huge central bank, but rather a new, for, uh, new reserve currency that doesn't have to be used, and they can continue to use their central banking currencies. It's not a replacement, but rather something that supplements these reserves and makes it far, far more stable and makes regional currencies far, far better as well. Second of all, the only concern their evidence has with an SDR system is that approval of system would be hard to garner. However, they conceded from the last speech that a plethora of nations, including China, the G20, and of many other nations support an SDR reserve system. This is very, very popular. Then. Let's talk about this idea of stability. They say that 41% of the basket is the dollar, which means if the dollar collapses, so does the basket. First of all, we would say the other 60% is a pretty good stabilizer. But second of all, more importantly, this is in a world with dollar hegemony. Right now, the basket is evaluated based off the fact that the dollar is the hegemonic uh, currency. However, in a world, world without dollar hegemony, which is what we're debating, we're telling you that the basket would be far more diverse and you wouldn't see the entire basket go, basket go down because a single country does badly, just like, for example, an index fund. Then, additionally, they tell you that non-IMF organizations are excluded, but we're, that's completely fine with us. We are not saying that this needs to be used as a day-to-day -day currency, but rather should be used as a strong reserve currency that allows regional currencies to do their job. On that note, let's talk about this idea about free trade. It makes absolutely no sense, and we'll tell you exactly why. Their swap is this idea that essentially they decrease exchange rate losses by going from a volatile nation's currency to a less volatile nation's currency to another volatile nation's currency. You're still having the exact same exchange rate losses as you would be from, an, uh, from a volatile one to another volatile one. I pointed this out in Crossfire, and they kind of dodged the question. But on the idea of the petrodollar, which is a really, really easy way to vote for us because it's absent the other aspects of today's debate, we explain to you very simply that the, that the United States, the USD demand is reliant on the petrodollar. Our opponent's only response is that it isn't. However, we give multiple sources and we also give empirics and we tell you that historically the United States has gotten involved in multiple uh, conflicts in the Middle East specifically because of the petrodollar and because of their partnership with Saudi Arabia. Insofar as this is true, we tell you that because of the petrodollar and as part of the US dollar hegemony, we are witnessing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people dying. And we tell you that the Yemen crisis, for example, caused by a proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia is the worst humanitarian crisis of our time, according to the UN. But in the long term, our opponents completely lose off the Triffin dilemma. This entire round, they don't respond to the notion that this is a completely unsustainable system, and in the long term, you see a collapse of confidence in the dollar. Even if in the short term and in the current state, it is able to maintain confidence, our opponents concede to the fact that in the long term, to be able to sustain uh, the entire currency system, you either need to, one, completely drop liquidity, which stunts the growth of the entire global economy, or two, collapse the United States through, for example, high debt payments, and that ultimately is going to collapse the system as a whole, which means that ultimately, dollar hegemony is going to collapse regardless of whether or not you like SDRs, and we're telling you that overall, that's a very, very simple reason to vote affirmative. Thank you.
want to say thank you to Mr. Baker, to our judges, and of course to our accomplished debaters. The IPPF World Champion will be named one hour from now at the awards ceremony. The IPPF World Champion receives a $10,000 grand prize and the Brewer Cup. For now, I will invite you all to join us in the Greenberg Room for the reception. <laughs>